Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, an update on breast pathology. I am Dr. Barbara Malkus, president of the board of directors for the Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition, and I'd like to thank you all for joining us today. Massachusetts Breast Cancer Coalition is dedicated to preventing environmental causes of breast cancer through community education, research advocacy, and changes to public policy. I am pleased to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Michael Michalek. Dr. Michalek currently serves as Associate Chair of Pathology at Newton Wellesley Hospital in Newton, Massachusetts. He is president of the Massachusetts Society of Pathologists and serves as MBCC's own medical advisor. He practices in all areas of pathology in a busy community hospital and holds an academic appointment at Tufts University School of Medicine, regularly instructing medical students and pathology residents. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Michalik, and it's a pleasure to have you back on our webinar. Thank you for the kind words and introduction. It's always a pleasure to come back and speak to the MBC audience, and I'll get this started here in a sec. Okay, you guys should be able to see that now. Yes, Dr. Michalik, we can okay, see great. your screen. Great. Wonderful. Uh, what I'd like to spend the next 45 to 50 minutes uh, discussing, and then we'll take some time for questions, is a really brand new area of pathology that's that's really just blossoming now, uh, and that's the use of artificial intelligence in pathology and one of the areas with perhaps the most traction is breast cancer pathology, coincidentally. And I, I thought it would be great to share sort of cutting edge technology, where we are right now, where, where we're going, uh, and where, where we've been, why, why this is a, a perfect time for artificial intelligence and, and some of the uses that will be coming down the road very, very shortly. Um, So how, how do we practice pathology now? Uh, pathology now is, is based on uh, using a microscope, looking at glass slides, but first it's, it's getting a specimen that we need to examine microscopically. And, and here's, here's a mastectomy specimen. Uh, this is one of our PAs. We've received this from the operating room. And the first thing we do is we ink the back a particular color. So that's, uh, we're able to orient the specimen when we look at it under the microscope because once we introduce some cuts into here, we want to know whether those are cuts that we made or the surgeon made, for, uh, particularly important for assessment of, of the margin and whether the whole tumor was, was taken out or not. Uh, so we'll, we'll ink it, we'll slice it, uh, and this is what a, a breast looks like cut on cross-section, all of this yellow is fat, most of the breast is fat. The uh, whiter, wispy regions in here are the fibrous tissue and the actual glandular parenchymal component of the breast where the ducts are, where milk is produced, transported, and that's where all the activity occurs in regards to breast cancer. Uh, what, what we'll do next when we examine a specimen like that is we'll then cut those slices up into smaller pieces and put them in these cassettes. These plastic cassettes are uh, about the size of just a half a dollar or just, just over a quarter size. And we'll cut sections of tissue small enough, we'll fit them in there, we'll close this latch down, it, it holds the tissue in there, and that's placed into a processor. Uh, the purpose of the processor is to uh, dehydrate the tissue and uh, subsequently permeate it with different concentrations of alcohol in preparation so that we can turn it into uh, a, 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 a suitable material in, in which to cut it. When, when it's fresh, it's very difficult to cut. It's not going to make great uh, slides and the morphology under the microscope will not be ideal. So we, we need to process it. That typically occurs overnight. Uh, the, the next morning, those cassettes are taken out. Uh, we place paraffin into them, and the uh, tissue that was 
in there uh, is embedded into that paraffin, it's hardened, and this becomes now a permanent representation of that tissue that we're going to store and keep for several years on, on site. And the beauty of this now is that we can take that block of tissue, put it in this instrument that we call a microtome. It's uh, got a very fine knife here, and it'll move up and down and cut these ribbons of tissue, of which <clears throat> a histo technologist will collect these sections, put them on the slide, and then stain it. Uh, there, the ribbon of tissue comes off. We will float it in this water bath and then uh, collect it on the slides, such as we have demonstrated here. And hopefully this is going to work. I've got a little little video of this. Um, you'll, you'll see when when we use the microtome to cut the tissue, it's, it's cutting at very, very, very thin sections. These are microns. These are a millionth of a, of a millimeter. And um, put it into this water bath of which we can break them apart like that and then use a glass slide. You'll see coming in here, we we'll put the glass slide in, we'll, we'll catch it and put it on to the slide. And the next step that's done after it's caught onto the slide is, is we need to stain it. If we were to look at it just uh, unstained, there wouldn't be any contrast between the cells. It would be difficult to make out the morphology and to uh, characterize the tumor and register the criteria we need to for the report. So we, we stain it. And uh, most labs use some form of automated stainer where uh, bulk numbers of slides are put in here and they're automatically uh, dipped through different uh, stains and uh, alcohol and xylene and cleaning solutions so that eventually at, at, at the end of this process, that takes maybe 45 minutes, uh, you'll have some glass slides with the tissue on there. It's stained in varying hues of uh, pink and purple. And the final step there is then to look at it under the microscope and sitting here next to my microscope. And this is something pathologists across the country do every day as these slides will be delivered in uh, slide boxes like this. And we'll go through each and every one of those slides to recreate the tumor and uh, characterize each one individually. All tumors are different. And for breast cancer, we're going to be measuring some key criteria that are going to make an impact on decisions for, for the next step for the patient, whether that patient, what, what type of patient or what type of chemotherapy that patient might require, whether additional surgery is needed. In other words, has the tumor been completely removed? What type of tumor is it? The grade of the tumor? Other biomarkers that I'll go into, whether it's estrogen positive or HER2 positive, that's all rendered by the pathologist. That diagnosis, all of those uh, markers are in the pathology report, and that really drives subsequent treatment, uh, whether it's more surgery, radiation, chemotherapy, or, or some combination of, of the three, uh, or, or nothing at all in, in some cases. <clears throat> and uh, I'd like to say that all treatment begins with the pathologist diagnosis, and uh, if you don't know your pathologist, you should try and reach out to them, get to know them, look at your path report, see who see who finalized it, see what lab it was done at, and if you have any questions, you could uh, reach out to them. They'd be happy to field those types of questions. Uh, so why 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 is artificial intelligence really needed here? It seems like we've got a pretty good process. Uh, this has been for decades the way we did things. Uh, Pathologists along the way have made discoveries, and we consistently are bringing up new biomarkers. And why, why, why do we really need to implement AI if it's going well as it has? Uh, one, one of the reasons is there's a significant workload for pathologists. Uh, now, post-COVID, we're, we're, we're seeing surges in patients coming to the hospital, but that's not something new, we were seeing volume increases 
before COVID, but I think uh, even now after COVID, there's significant strains on our workload. Uh, patients are getting more complex. Uh, some of the diagnoses are a little bit more challenging. Uh, there's complexity certainly involved in making diagnoses. Still, there's the typical breast cancers that are straightforward, but there's always um, challenges, particularly now since some patients may have some what we call neoadjuvant therapy. They may be treated before surgery, before we see the excision, uh, and that introduces some challenges into recognizing residual tumor, whether there is any that exists, whether it's viable or not, and scoring that. That's that's important information that the oncologist needs needs to know. Uh, that can be challenging and complex. <clears throat> this process that I outlined is, is pretty tedious. There's a lot of repetitive tasks to it, and that's, that's a prime candidate. Those criteria are uh, perfect uh, for developing algorithms for artificial intelligence, trying to automate some of these repetitive processes. You've seen we've automated the staining, so why can't we automate some of the, the diagnostic uh, part of, of pathology? I mentioned biomarkers, and when I'm talking about breast cancer, that's mostly estrogen, progesterone, and HER2. Uh, we evaluate those on every single new breast cancer diagnosis. Sometimes we look at what's called a proliferation index, how rapidly the, the tumor is dividing, and that's that's another marker, KI67. Some of you may see that in reports. Those, those are all uh, tedious uh, tasks that require counting, that require uh, looking at large numbers of fields under the microscope, and that's a perfect uh, setup for implementing some uh, AI technology there. <clears throat> These tasks are time consuming, uh, they can be labor intensive, and they, they are subject to variability between pathologists. One pathologist may count uh, mitotic figures or dividing cells a little bit differently than another, or one may grade a tumor slightly different. The, we, the way we grade tumors are they're well differentiated, moderate, or poorly, meaning how closely do they resemble normal breast tissue. And, and there may be some variability, particularly in the in in the middle category. <clears throat> AI has been used for a long time in other industries. <clears throat> we've we've seen AI uh, be used in logistics and transportation, uh, food technology, manufacturing, banking and financial services, travel, retail, e-commerce, real estate, entertainment. Any of these. Uh, Industries, if you go onto their website and you're on a, uh, a chat feature of the website, that's typically artificial intelligence. That's, that's, uh, there's algorithms running in the background uh, that um, uh, uh, sort of uh, presuppose what your questions are and, and guide you down the, the right tree. Uh, if you're searching on Amazon for something, the, the Suggestions that Amazon shows you are based on your prior browsing and, and shopping experience. That's that's artificial intelligence. Uh, so our artificial intelligence is is really used throughout in industry, as I'm sure many of you are aware. And it's 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 making its way into healthcare. Uh, it's it's already being used in radiology. Is a good example where there are uh, tools that enable the radiologist to uh, find a tumor more easily than before. Uh, for instance, in, in breast cancer screening, there are, there are computer uh, algorithms that will help highlight tumors and, and make them more prominent. Uh, and, and that now has crossed over into pathology. <clears throat> but why, why has pathology been, been uh, sort of the last adopter here? Uh, not only of, of industries, but also within medicine, AI, as I mentioned, in radiology, but also in other uh, areas of medicine. We already have uh, surgeons using uh, robotics to do surgeries, and uh, that's that's a form of artificial intelligence. So why, why has pathology been, been a, a 
bit behind. <clears throat> One of the perhaps the major reason is it requires digital pathology. What what I showed to you at, at the beginning of the talk here was uh, mostly uh, the traditional path of how pathology is. Uh, how labs work and how diagnoses are made. Uh, it's all done in a quote analog sense, meaning we will dissect the tissue, we'll create the slide, and then the slide goes right to the microscope. We, we look through the microscope at, at the slide. Cost is, is the other thing. And to implement digital pathology, what I mean by digital pathology is to capture those images on the slide and essentially remove the microscope from, from the pathologist's desk and the pathologist will simply be looking at a monitor and viewing the slide virtually on the monitor, controlling magnifications from their mouse, uh, moving it around to different areas, zooming in, zooming out. Uh, it, that's really the necessary first step to any sort of artificial intelligence that we want to implement in pathology because we can't uh, uh, capture data points and store them to make algorithms for the computer to learn if we don't have a digital image of something. If we just have the slide, we can't uh, feed that data into a computer without first capturing it digitally. It require, requires right now a pretty significant financial investment to implement digital pathology. And one of the, the biggest barriers or the, the biggest cost uh, feature of that is the, the storage, the amount of memory that's required to store the images for just a single slide, uh, just a routine slide that uh, could, could take up to on the level of terabytes of, of information. And when you multiply that by 20, 30 slides for a, a breast cancer, it, it is a lot, a lot of memory. So uh, just like anything else in technology and computers, every year they get faster, some get cheaper, the, the technology improves and, and the price does come down. Uh, so I, I believe that there's gonna be a point of which the, the price is, is reached that in infliction point of which it's going to be more uh, rapidly adopted throughout the pathology community. Uh, this this is an example of one such digital pathology solution. Uh, now this this would be an add-on to that current workflow that I showed you. We still have to dissect the tissue, process it, cut it, put it onto a slide, stain it. Uh, and then before it got, gets to the pathologist, it'll be scanned by an instrument such, such as this, which digitizes the slide and can be viewed on the microscope. Uh, this, this is the, the, the bottleneck currently of, of where we're a bit held up on widespread implementation. And part of it, as I mentioned, is, is the cost. And another one, there's, there's um, unlike radiology where the implementation of digital radiology uh, removed a step of the process. In, in, in other words, when radiologists used to look at images, they created uh, x-rays or CAT scans, MRI films, and would put them up on the board and look at them. Uh, digital radiology got rid of that. That's no longer created. It's all images. Here, we, we still have to create the slide and scan it. So uh, it, it's not removing a step or it's not saving on glass slides or the technologist's work of creating a glass slide. It's definitely an add-on to the process, which creates additional costs, but that is my opinion of why it hasn't been adopted uh, quicker, but it will be, and there's many labs that are using it. So once this is in place, we can then it, the field of pathology is wide open for what we can use AI for. And uh, right now, the, the sky's the limit. Uh, I'm just going to focus on breast cancer and some of the current technology that's available to give you a, a, just a, a flavor of, of how things are, are changing for, for pathologists. Uh, for instance, this, this is one company that 
uh, has algorithms built in that will be able to detect breast cancer in a tissue. So this is on the slide, it's been digitized. This is the image that comes up on the screen. Remember, we're not looking through a microscope anymore. We're looking at a, a computer monitor. We're, we're looking at, at the tissue. And it's obvious here that there are, to, to a pathologist, it's obvious that there's clusters of tumor cells floating in use, and there's really no normal uh, breast tissue here. This is a needle biopsy. Uh, but in a more subtle case, it, it might be difficult to pick out very limited cancer, cancer that may be at the edge of the biopsy, or cancer that's hidden by inflammatory changes, something else that's benign. Uh, and I'll, I'll just play this for you here. Um, there would be an algorithm that creates a heat map to the tissue, and uh, red being areas of high probability of cancer, blue less so, and everything else is, is uh, definitely benign. So if it wasn't apparent on the original H&E stain slide, now the pathologist can simply click on this program and overlay uh, a, quote, heat map and zero in on areas that uh, previously they may not have thought there was cancer there. And this is definitely, definitely a, uh, a big help to us. It will help in screening slides, it will help uh, targeting our review of uh, dozens of slides to particular areas and, and kind of pre-select areas for us to, to review. Uh, that's that's an uh, invasive cancer. It can also be used to detect DCIS, uh, ductal carcinoma in situ, which is uh, a very uh, I, it has a lot of inter-observer variability based on the grade of the DCIS and how closely it resembles normal breast tissue. Uh, just to recap, normal breast tissue uh, in, in this photo here is uh, made up of ducts and lobules. They look like these little rings of uh, breast tissue cells with a lumen. Remember, the breast function is, is milk production, so it's going to create uh, secretions, which then flow down these duct lumens to reach the, the main nipple duct. Uh, these, these ducts can proliferate, meaning the cells can divide, and that's something that normally happens. And if it uh, looks normal to us under the microscope, we might call it hyperplasia. Uh, then hyperplasia can become atypical. We, we might call it atypical ductal hyperplasia. Uh, and even further down the spectrum, uh, once it gains some more molecular mutations and morphologic changes, then it may reach the point at which we call it a, a cancer, a uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. And here's here, here's an example of a couple of ducts that are filled with cancer, and it's it's recognizable here on just the H and E slide. But you can imagine if you had some usual ductal hyperplasia and some atypical and then DCIS, how might you make that discrimination? Right, right now, what, what a pathologist would do is we maybe have some stains that we can do to help make the distinction. We'll, we'll show cases around to our colleagues. We'll pick up the slide, walk next door, show it to, show it to some of my colleagues, or we may send it out to a, another recognized expert out, outside of the institution to uh, adjudicate if there's any sort of differences within the group. Those those are the tools we have now. But with AI, one could implement this same type of program and create a heat map here and highlight exactly where where there's a high probability of there being cancer. And the the red here is ductal carcinoma in situ. This is uh, clearly visible, and pathologists can then back it up and, and look at this uh, again on under H&E and go sort of back and forth and, and see, okay, now this area that I thought was maybe just atypical ductal hyperplasia, it's actually giving me high confidence that, that it's DCIS. And this, this is really transforming pathology because now uh, we have the images stored digitally. So instead of uh, me needing to get other people's opinions, I may still do that and still 
regularly do, but now I've got another adjunct to say this this is probably cancer and and uh, gives me that further confidence to to make the diagnosis outright. Uh, the the beauty of of the digital pathology is I, I can share these images almost instantaneously with colleagues across the hallway, colleagues across town, or colleagues across the country or or the world, and other pathologists can weigh in rather than me having to box up the slides and send them by by courier across town, across the state, or across the the, the country, and uh, get I, I can get feedback almost in, instantaneously. Um, so, so that's one application that there are a number of companies out there that have developed these algorithms for uh, helping in the diagnosis of breast cancer. So once, once we've diagnosed breast cancer, one of the first and most important things a pathologist does is to assign a, a grade to that cancer, meaning how closely does that cancer look like? normal tissue or how much does it vary and that's perhaps one of the strongest predictors of prognosis for a patient whether it's a low-grade tumor a high-grade tumor and it also factors into subsequent care for the patient are they at high risk for recurrence do they need adjuvant treatment meaning do they need additional treatment after surgery such as chemotherapy radiation or more more surgery and AI has found utility here. Um, here's, here's an H&E image of, of a breast cancer, and uh, here's a higher power view. And what the algorithm here has done is uh, we, we've taught the computer how to recognize mitotic figures. And a mitotic figure is a cell that divides, and mitoses are at the heart of cancer in that the cancer needs to divide to survive. And uh, one of the measures that goes into grading a, a cancer is how many mitotic figures can we count under the microscope? And here the computer has given us an aid in that it shows us where to look for mitotic figures. And I think I've got a higher power image here. Uh, these little structures in, in the green circles are mitotic figures or dividing tumor cells. Uh, this, this is all tumor here. Here's another higher power view of a, of a lesser, uh, more poorly differentiated tumor showing mitotic figures as well. Sometimes they're easy to count, sometimes they're tough to count, but having a tool like this of showing me areas of where it's most like, where I'm most likely to find mitotic figures is definitely an adjunct. It makes my job easier. It makes my job more, uh, um, uh, it creates high, higher quality in, in the workflow and decreases variability among, among pathologists by uh, semi-automating the process and making it highly reproducible across different pathologists. In other words, if, if uh, one pathologist diagnoses a particular cancer as a poorly differentiated ductal carcinoma, measuring X millimeters, uh, you could take those same images, give it to another pathologist, and there's a very high likelihood they're going to uh, render the same exact diagnosis based on using some of these adjuncts, some of these uh, AI tools. One of the other major features of breast cancer uh, diagnosis is, is looking at the status of the lymph nodes. Uh, if you've joined me on prior talks in, in the past, I've, I've uh, talked about the staging system for cancer, and that's based on the TNM, meaning the T is criteria of the tumor, tumor characteristics. The N is the lymph node status, whether there's tumor within lymph nodes, what we call metastases, and the M is for the presence or absence of distant metastases. And there are criteria and scoring for each of those letters, T, N, M, and, and M, and based on the combination, the different permutations that one could get for different char tumor characteristics and lymph node metastases or absence thereof, we can create a, a stage for the tumor, and we will label a patient with stage 
one, stage two, stage three, stage four, stage two A, two B. There, it's it's broken down even further, and that's the basis for which drives uh, prognosis, drives therapy, uh, and gives the oncologist and the treating team uh, the ability to uh, individualize therapy based based on your particular tumor stage. One thing that that can be tough and uh, subtle sometimes is finding little nests of tumor cells and not not only nests but single tumor cells in lymph nodes and here's here's a low power image of a uh, lymph node and uh, when some a patient has breast cancer surgery though we usually uh, also take out a, a lymph node and we'll call it the sentinel lymph node meaning it's it's the first lymph node that receives drainage from that area of, of the body. So if there's going to be tumor in a lymph node, it most likely would be uh, manifested by being present in that one lymph node. So we can use that sentinel lymph node as, a, as an indicator of uh, whether there's a metastasis or not and how likely it is that there's tumor elsewhere. It's, it's unlikely that it's going to skip that sentinel lymph node and go elsewhere. So if we have a clean sentinel lymph node, we have a high level of confidence that the tumor hasn't spread to the lymph nodes at all. Uh, here's a low power view and just looking at low power without the computer overlay here of, of the red, uh, it, it would be tough to find any tumor. And it's not until higher power that it starts to become apparent that these are all lymphocytes in the background here in a lymph node with a capsule. But just underneath the capsule are some tumor glands. And this is a this is a metastasis. This is tumor that has spread to a lymph node. And one can imagine that this this could is most likely going to be seen just on routine H and E stain by a pathologist, but there are algorithms that can find this, can highlight it for the pathologist. So uh, instead of spending a fair amount of time scrutinizing the entire area of this lymph node, looking under every so-called crack and crevice here to look for these clusters of tumor cells. One now can uh, devote time to areas that are very, very suspicious that are highlighted by the computer. And here, e even smaller, is just a cluster of perhaps one or even two tumor glands that could be missed uh, by just routine H&E, that's called hematoxylin eosin stain right, right here, uh, or even single tumor cells. So definitely AI has some application into not only our diagnosis of breast cancer, but also our, our uh, characterizing the tumor and grading the tumor as, as to uh, what, what it looks like, how, how far it's spread, if it has, and if it hasn't. AI is also being used in biomarker quantification. As I mentioned, this is one of the, the repetitive or tedious tasks that a pathologist will do. Uh, estrogen receptor, that's what ER stands for. Right now, what, what we will do is all new breast cancers, we will stain for ER, and that's done by substituting a uh, antibody for estrogen rather than the hematoxylin and eosin stains that I've been showing. And these usually show up as some staining of brown. Uh, here's here's a tumor where you don't see any staining that would be ER negative. Here's one that uh, you see some staining. It's it's more than 10%. We're going to call that positive, but it could perhaps be a, a low positive. Uh, and also the intensity uh, is important to report by pathologists. And we, we score these. Is it is it weak? Is it moderate? Or is it strong staining? And, and what percentage of tumor cells are staining? Doing that on every single tumor is is repetitive. It, it can uh, be prone to some variability between patient between uh, pathologists. So there are algorithms, programs being developed right now that are in use, uh, and more to come that will automate this process and assist the pathologist. Now the computer will overlay areas where it's predicting to be high positivity that helps the pathologist count the, the estrogen uh, positivity for that tumor and, and more reliably 
uh, classify the estrogen status. And that's that's becoming more and more important as we learn the importance of, of low estrogen positivity and, and the criteria there haven't been as well defined as, as they're becoming now. The same thing goes for HER2. Uh, HER2 is, a, is another biomarker that we examine routinely on every new invasive cancer, uh, like ER, it's a stain. And here's an example of a tumor that's uh, strongly staining for HER2. We would call that three plus staining. Uh, this would be in the pathology report that we uh, will, will provide for each tumor is the intensity uh, of that staining and whether there is staining or not. For instance, at, at the top here, this is a tumor that has no staining at all. This is one that has a little bit. We score that as one plus. Here's one that has even more tumor staining, two plus and three plus. Currently right now, the HER2 therapies like Herceptin, uh, they're, they're uh, indicated in, in three plus, but now we're learning more and more about two plus and even one plus HER2 staining. Uh, there's uh, proven uh, efficacy of HER2 therapy in tumors that are less than three plus. And he, this is another perfect avenue for implementing some type of AI uh, technology in that there can be a lot of discrepancy between pathologists on if a tumor is one plus or if it's two plus. What, what we do now, if we call something two plus, we'll usually do some additional stains or studies on it to try and push it into maybe it's it's a positive two plus or or it's a negative two plus. We can now use AI uh, to help in that decision making and, and give us another tool of whether uh, that that tumor is is going to benefit from her two targeted therapy, un unlike what what we've had before. Another avenue that's in use for AI and in breast cancer is now predicting prognosis, survival, and therapy response. Currently, what, what we use now, and many of you have probably heard about this, is Oncotype. Uh, Oncotype DX, it's a proprietary uh, algorithm that's based on a number of different proliferation markers, gene mutations of a tumor that will generate a score, and that's called a response. A, a recurrence score. And what, what that gives the oncologist is the likelihood that that tumor is going to recur down the road. Uh, for instance, this is just a sample report of a, of a cancer with a score of 13, which would translate to a distant recurrence risk at nine years of 4%. And this is the benefit of adding chemotherapy, meaning the, the average absolute chemotherapy benefit can see it's it's unlikely to have uh, additional benefit for the patient. This currently now is is done on a, a lot of cancers, and it's what oncologists will sometimes use to determine whether the patient would benefit from some additional chemotherapy after surgery, or whether it's unlikely to be a, a benefit. And um, one would think, well, how how is this going to benefit from AI? Uh, this is just the second page of the Oncotype report, which usually gives some uh, 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 curves here about the particular score, the relative risk of a recurrence uh, at 10 years, and whether uh, just doing nothing, giving tamoxifen plus chemotherapy or chemotherapy alone, whether it will make a difference for, for that patient. And believe it or not, there are algorithms now currently in development that can predict the Oncotype score just based on digital images, not even uh, taking that tissue, analyzing it for mutations, testing it for some of the proliferation markers that are in the Oncotype DX uh, formula, but just looking at images. And uh, this, this is not something that we just plug into the computer and, and it'll predict it. This, this comes from screening thousands of cancers that have a known Oncotype DX score. For instance, this is a low Oncotype DX score tumor. Here's one with a high uh, Oncotype DX, meaning a high risk of recurrence as a patient who would benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. And 
uh, training the computer to characterize and learn from, okay, what's a low score look like? Here's what it looks like on H&E. Here's a little higher power view of that tumor. And then we can overlay, well, looking at the individual tumor cells, how do they cluster? How do they grow? How do they interconnect? And creating an algorithm here that is gonna then be able to take a tumor from the start and predict whether it's gonna be a low or a high on oncotype score. And you, you can see the benefit of that. It, it may uh, give the oncologist further information about uh, the benefit of, of chemotherapy in, in this patient and further be able to individualize treatment for patients. That's, that's the whole idea of what we call precision medicine is tailoring treatment specific for a patient's cancer. No two cancers are alike, even under the microscope. Uh, pathologically, tumors could look similar, but more, but at the molecular level, they may differ widely. And it's through some of these algorithms from artificial intelligence that we're able to exploit that information at the level of which I can't see under the microscope and that we can uh, uh, predict just by using these, these digital images. Uh, one, one other uh, final area that AI is, has some utility in, in breast cancer is predicting genetic abnormalities. And uh, I just chose one example here of predicting BRCA or, or BRCA mutations. Right now, the way to test for a BRCA mutation is to do a blood test, do uh, germline testing, meaning we're looking at, at the chromosomes of the patient, whether they have inherited a BRCA mutation and whether they're susceptible to breast cancer, but not only breast cancer, uh, there are other BRCA-derived uh, uh, cancers such as ovarian, uh, and that's typically and still done in a molecular lab, but there are algorithms now that are uh, working to predict some of these mutations just based on what the tissue looks like under the microscope and digitally re recreate it. Uh, and, and this is a, a paper that came out a couple of years ago that uh, demonstrated an algorithm that was developed by training a computer based on the tumor, uh, looking at specific areas within that tumor, running a, a deep learning model, and then having a learning set up front of, of tumors that had BRCA mutations, tumors that didn't have BRCA mutations, and looking at characteristics that are below the level of discrimination by the human eye. These are things that I'm not gonna be able to see under the microscope, but only a computer can run the computations needed to uh, assess how cells uh, uh, communicate, how, how, they, how they relate to each other. And that gives a lot of information and we can make predictions of, about BRCA mutations just based on images alone without molecular testing. So that's, that's really transformational in the work I, I do as, as a pathologist. That's something I'm, I'm haven't ever been able to do, and usually something that requires additional testing, time, uh, waiting, expense. Now that whole workflow is going to undergo changes here in the very, very near future. Uh, what What are some of the limitations though, of of artificial intelligence and and digital pathology? Uh, part of it is the system is only as good as how we teach it. Uh, so we have to develop training sets. We have to develop high quality and high numbers of different types of tumors, all sorts of tumors, tumors that are well differentiated, tumors that are poorly differentiated, tumors that are ER positive, that are ER negative, that are HER2 positive, HER2 negative, every single permutation and combination of tumor. We want to feed in to the program so that we can create the most robust, the most reproducible, high quality algorithm that's gonna, uh, that, that, that's gonna be giving us important information about patient 
prognosis and need need for treatment. Uh, these these training sets are are gonna and they're they're being developed now. So that's that's one limitation is to make sure that it's 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 got robust high quality uh, data that's gone into the development. We we have to validate these algorithms before we use them. We just can't create an algorithm and put it out there and start uh, uh, automating some of our diagnoses. We, we have to validate them, meaning we have to test it on a thousand tumors and across multiple different pathologists doing it the traditional way, comparing results and then doing it through AI assisted technologies and seeing what, what the correlation is and making sure there's a high degree of, of uh, correlation between uh, the pathologist diagnosis, the AI uh, facilitated diagnosis, and any other uh, criteria which AI is helping the pathologist count or to record. So we, we definitely need to test that for use. And that's no different than any other technological breakthrough in pathology. For instance, in the lab here at the hospital, if we're going to bring on a new test in, in the lab, we're, we're going to put the test on and we're going to run it on a hundred patients and make sure it, it performs as as expected. Same same thing goes for art, artificial intelligence. Uh, I, I started off the talk talking about digital pathology and it's really a uh, absolute required step. There's no way one can get to artificial intelligence without being able to transform what we see under the microscope into digital images, then that then that then can be uh, uh, examined by a computer, processed, and run through these algorithms in a digital fashion, rather than what I call the analog method of of just diagnosing off of a, a glass slide. Finally, pathologist trust is is a, another uh, strong limiting factor in that pathologists are creatures of habit. They've been doing things uh, for a particular way for years, decades, and have learned from our elder uh, uh, tutors through medical school and, and training, residency, fellowship, and uh, the way things have been done. We continue to do them, but we've now developed breakthroughs and are starting to question, well, it, does it really have to be done that way? Can we use some of these other tools that are being used in other areas of medicine to uh, innovate the diagnostic process in pathology? And, and that's definitely occurring now. I think uh, as it becomes more widespread, as pathologists begin to uh, have more trust in these training sets, the, the strength of the training set and uh, what sort of quality uh, data there is published, then we're going to start to turn the corner and, and be able to implement this more widely. My vision, not just my vision, but a lot of pathologists' vision of, of the pathology lab of the future is that uh, we, we will be using AI and digital pathology in, as, as an adjunct, as a tool to what we currently do, but it will facilitate are reaching a diagnosis in a more efficient manner. It will do it with a higher level of confidence, a higher level of quality that's going to be reproducible between pathologists. For instance, uh, I, I may get a slide now, I look at it under the microscope, I decide I have to do some extra stains on it. Uh, if, if it's a cancer, I'm going to order estrogen, progesterone, HER2, uh, and have to wait for that for the next day. Uh, for instance, there could be an AI developed workflow so that before that slide even gets to me on the computer monitor, the computer has recognized that it's a cancer. It's gone ahead, it's ordered the estrogen, it's ordered the progesterone, it's ordered the HER2. So when I see those images for the first time, I'm going to be able to overlay the ER and report that instantly. I'm going to be able to report HER2 instantly. I may be able to give uh, data about what the likelihood of an Oncotype DX score is or a BRCA mutation. This is all up front in the original pathology report, not something that typically right now 
is an addendum that comes days or even weeks later uh, based on what, what test was ordered. Uh, not, not only testing for some of those esoteric markers, but routine things that uh, we, we don't uh, generally talk a lot about with other clinicians and patients are just getting to the diagnosis may require looking at multiple slides or recutting a slide, making a slide again, or going a little deeper into that tissue block because I may not be seeing the whole tumor. Uh, those those take time right now. If, if I see a tumor, but I wanna visualize it a little better, I, I may ask for a, a deeper cut into that paraffin block that takes time, whereas digital pathology may uh, pre-screen those slides before they even reach my microscope and have already ordered those additional levels for me. So at, at the time I am looking at it, it, it will predict that I'm going to want those deepers and already have them on, on hand for me. Uh, not only for, for diagnosis of, of patients, uh, predicting uh, out, outcomes, but also consults all the time. Patients may um, want a second opinion instead of packaging up slides and sending them to another uh, another institution we can just digitally email or make available through the cloud the images and instantly that pathologist at another institution is going to have access and be able to issue a report in in record time something that we've never been able to do before uh, we, we can easily prepare tumors for tumor boards, for our conferences when we discuss these cases with other colleagues rather than taking uh, uh, static images of tumors. Now we're gonna have a uh, live stream of a tumor that I could move around and show a group of other doctors as we meet to decide best best care for, for patients. Uh, so in, in summary, um, AI is, finally making its way into pathology. Uh, but first, digital pathology must gain widespread implementation. And these tools are definitely gonna transform the practice of pathology. Uh, one of, one of uh, pathologists' concern, not universally held, but there's, there's definitely a, a population of pathologists who feel that it's, I'm gonna risk my job with AI, it's just gonna take over and won't, won't even need a pathologist. Pathologists are always going to be needed. Uh, it's still going to take the human hand, the human eye to put together the report, to put together all of these uh, characteristics of the tumor. AI is just helping us reach that diagnosis. Uh, in famous words of one of our highly esteemed breast pathologists at at the Brigham, Dr. Stu Schnett, he said, uh, AI will not replace pathologists, but pathologists who use AI may well replace pathologists who do not use AI. And that goes back to uh, the, the third bullet point here is that the, these tools are definitely transforming the practice of pathology and, and bringing pathology into the 21st century. Be happy to take any questions. Um, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for taking the time to listen, and I'll, I'll turn it back over. Thank you so much, Dr. Michalik, for a really, again, a very informative presentation for us. Um, I would ask that anybody who's listening in today who has a question that they would like to ask Dr. Michalik, you can put that in the questions feature of the GoToWebinar panel. Just click on the icon that, says, that is next to questions. It'll open up a window and you can type your question in there. In the meantime, Dr. Mitchell, I, I have to say I did appreciate you bringing me back to my undergrad days in my histology class at the beginning of your presentation, talking about the process by which slides are prepared, um, uh, saw some uh, vocabulary I haven't seen there in a long time around the use of the microtome and developing the tissue sample in paraffin. That was a little surprising to me that that has still been such a consistent practice because for me, that's over 40 years ago. So when do you think AI will be really in widespread use in pathology? 
I, I, I think it's, it's on the order of the three to five year time frame. It's, there's already labs, uh, often larger academic medical center labs that have the resources to invest into digital pathology and develop some of these algorithms and, and put them into practice. Uh, so it's already here. The question is, how quickly is the uptake going to be? And, and I feel like we're reaching that inflection point where the cost analysis now is tipping in favor of it's worth the investment, it pays the dividends that we've predicted here and that we're beginning to see in our medical journals, the, the pathology journals, the peer-reviewed literature is showing that it's effective, it, it uh, is is definitely becoming uh, the the practice model, and I think it's it's probably on the order of three to five years where we'll see it more widely adopted. And how widely is AI being used right now? As I mentioned, it's mostly larger pathology labs, uh, academic medical centers, some of the large reference labs. Uh, I'd say it's probably on the order of maybe 10% of, of the pathology uh, community out there has AI, uh, and I'm using that synonymously with digital pathology, perhaps digital pathology a little bit higher, but hand-in-hand uh, -hand with digital pathology really goes AI. And with regards to the heat maps that you were showing us, and, and the use of the AI heat map, um, how precise are those? And is there a, are, are there any comparative studies being done in order to kind of bring this to scale? Definitely, and, and that's a great question. I, I left out, or I, I, I didn't put into the talk a lot of the uh, publications out there showing this, but there is a high, degree of concordance between the pathologist diagnosis and the AI-assisted diagnosis or even prediction. Uh, we're talking uh, 90, high, high 90%, 98, 99% concordance be between the two. And that's really, really um, as pretty much as good as it gets. And there's no longer a question of uh, is it good or not? It's really well how good it's really that good that it's just a matter of getting it into implementation now and if i'm a patient and ai is not used at the institution that i'm going to is it possible for me to consider having slides being sent to another institution where they could be reviewed using ai uh that's that's a good question and I'm um, trying to think if I've come across that scenario. I don't think so, or if it has, I haven't been aware of it, but there's no reason that it couldn't be done. Uh, as you recall, all the process needs for digital pathology is the glass slides. That's, that's the input into the whole system. Uh, so if your diagnosis was made off of glass slides, one could definitely uh, digitize that and render a diagnosis as well. Mo more likely than not, it's going to be the same diagnosis. As, as I mentioned, we've been doing pathology for decades, hundreds of years, and pathologists are good. Pathologists are really good. And uh, that's, that's the gold standard, really, with which a lot of these studies of AI are used. Uh, so it's, it's a bit of a loaded question in, in the sense that um, the gold standard is, is the morphologic by eyeball uh, characterization of a tumor. And the AI just makes our job easier. We're able to handle increased workload, increased repetitive tasks, uh, and uh, make some predictions. But right, right now, we can do all of that with the tools that we already have. So for instance, if you're thinking, well, maybe I should get my slides looked at by AI so that I can get another Oncotype score or another BRCA test. It, it's really not, it's, it's not necessary because there the gold standard is BRCA by 
molecular methods of just a blood test or the Oncotype DX gold standard is the Oncotype test that uh, the patient may have already had. Uh, so it's it's really not necessary to do that. Uh, it's it's more on the pathologist end for making our workflow much more efficient, being able to allow us to make to continue to make quality diagnoses. And it it it, it factors into you've heard a lot about burnout in, in medicine, and, and this is definitely a tool that's going to limit burnout uh, among pathologists because it's going to take the burden off of some of the repetitive tasks that are 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 tough to do. Well, I can't believe we've already gone over our hour and there were still some questions to be answered. I would ask that folks, um, if you, when this webinar is posted uh, later this afternoon, you will be able to get contact information for Dr. Mishlik, or you can contact MBCC. Um, and we are happy to make sure those questions get passed along to Dr. Mishlik so that all questions can be answered. On behalf of myself and MBCC's Board of Directors and Executive Director Cheryl Osimo, I want to thank Dr. Michalek for this important and informative discussion today. And I want to thank all of our many listeners for joining us. For those interested, the recording of this webinar will be made available later today on the MBCC website at mbcc.org. Have a good afternoon and thank you again, Dr. Michalek. Great. Thank you, everybody.